Thanks for coming. So glad to see you. Just wanted to introduce this amazing keynote speaker for you tonight. Let's go, Mark. Um, yes, um, the foremost expert on natural law based on objective morality, who has been very astute and razor focused on spreading the word of this ancient wisdom. He has massive courage to say what is needed and and true no matter what the consequences, a man who is steadfast in his commitment to spreading occult knowledge so that we can be so enlightened as to be the sovereign creators of our own collective reality. At times we need a spark, a mentor, a trailblazer, a leader who can motivate us to step up to the next level of what is required for our own individual soul, soul quest towards pure freedom. So it's my utmost, deepest pleasure to introduce Mark Passio. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you to Victoria for extending me the invitation to speak at this great event. Thank you to all of the other organizers for the great job they've done in putting together the event this weekend. Just so uh, I get an idea for myself, how many people are, would say that they're somewhat or very familiar with my work by a show of hands? How many people would say that they're new, uh, entirely new or somewhat new? Okay, great, thank you. So today, um, I'm probably going to uh, be considered to be one of the more extreme speakers here today, uh, someone with more radical ideas to present. Uh, my presentation here today is entitled, Government is Slavery. And uh, this is true, and I'm going to explain why it's true, and I'm going to explain the solution to this condition. trying to advance, it's not advancing. So I'll call for the advance, there you go. So that's the title, uh, next slide. I start my presentations off with uh, some basic caveats or warnings if you will. Uh, there, you're not gonna be seeing anything brand new here today. This knowledge has been around since time immemorial. Uh, a lot of people say, uh, well, I've heard things like this before uh, that you present. And yes, that's no surprise. You're not going to be seeing anything brand new here. As the old saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. This saying means that truth is objective and eternal. It has always been with us. It always will be with us. Uh, it's whether we actually recognize it or not and put it into practice in our lives. All that I can do as a presenter is present the truth in a personalized framework with my own particular style and aesthetics applied to the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. That being said, um, I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. And this presentation is for psychologically mature adults who are ready to hear hard truths spoken. So this is not for people who appear to be adults bodily, but are actually uh, have the psychological mentation of a child who attempts to think and reason with their emotions. If you're that type of an emotional person, this information is probably going to be very difficult for you to hear, but guess what? That's okay. It's still true anyway. Next slide, please. So my presentation style is very direct, it's often very intense. It, some people even describe it as combative, and that's okay. I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some people are very likely to become upset or angered by what I will say during this presentation, so be it. That will never make the material untrue, because truth by its very nature is belligerent, because it wages war against all forms of deception and mind control things that are very, very real and very actively taking place in our society. Telling the truth and making someone cry is far better than telling a lie and making someone smile. Next slide, please. Uh, back it up one, please. Oh, no, uh, forward, I'm sorry. So why do I personally do this work? 
I don't present this information to be liked, to be popular, to make money, or to make friends. I speak publicly because I recognize that in the crisis of overwhelming ignorance and deception in which we live, I have a personal moral obligation to communicate what I know to be taking place in our world in order to help others to understand it so that they can then take action and do something about it. I do the work that I do simply because it is the right thing to do. Uh, I don't have any fear of reprisal or consequence, even though I'll tell you some of my background uh, in the presentation. Um, right is right even if everyone is against it. Wrong is wrong even if everybody is for it. So uh, that's my personal motivation. Next slide, please. This is my website, whatonearthishappening.com. That's my logo. And uh, next slide. Uh, I consider myself an abolitionist. I am for the eradication of human slavery. So uh, I call myself different things. I'm an aggregator of information and ancient knowledge. Uh, I am a studier of the occult, uh, which is my background. I consider myself a de-occultist. I am taking hidden knowledge uh, from time immemorial in human civilization, and I am trying to take it out of hiding and explode it onto the world so that other people can make informed decisions with that information. But most of all, I consider myself an abolitionist. I stand against all forms of slavery. That's physical, that's spiritual, that's covert and overt forms of slavery. I think slavery is the abomination of all abominations. It is the most horrible crime that could ever be committed against any being. And I stand against that in all of its forms, and you should be an abolitionist too if you consider yourself a good and moral person. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna present this uh, presentation in three parts. Part one is the problem, or what I call the truth regarding the human condition. Part two is going to be why the problem persists. And part three is going to be the actual solution to solving the problem of human slavery. Next slide, please. So there is a truth regarding the human condition. The human condition is slavery. Now, how many people find that shocking to hear by a show of hands? No one. People generally have an idea that something is incredibly wrong in our world, and this is what it is. There is violence, there is coercion, there is duress, and putting all of those things together, that equals slavery in a particular form. The form that it exists in right now, currently, is not what I call ball chain and shackle slavery. It is not chattel slavery. Chattel slavery, unfortunately, is still practiced in some areas of the world, obviously has been practiced in our past. Huge abomination, unbelievably immoral, should never ever be tolerated. This is not the current form that slavery is taking to a large extent in our world. Next slide please. This is the form that it is taking. The human condition is covert slavery, not overt ball chain and shackle chattel slavery. It is a form of covert or hidden slavery that works through the mind. We are conditioned to believe false axiomatic premises and belief systems that then become an enslavement process. And that is where we find ourselves right now, in a, a prison of the mind, which is the worst form of slavery in many ways because it is the most difficult to see and it is the most difficult to conquer. But that is the human condition. Next slide, please. The form of slavery that we are experiencing is called government. Government is a covert form of slavery built upon a false axiom. An axiom is a fundamental belief system that is held very, very, very deeply 
in the mind. It is rooted. It has deep roots in the mind. It has deep roots in the emotions and in the psyche of people who believe in this belief system. The belief system or axiomatic premise that all forms of government throughout all of human history is based upon is the belief in authority. Government is authority. It is not suggestion. It is telling people that you must comply, you must obey. You must turn over whatever resources we tell you you must turn over. You must cease and desist in enacting rights if we tell you you may not enact them. And we saw this all through the COVID nonsense you know, that we all just went through. The very idea of human authority is an illusion. It's an illusion and a delusion. For one to believe in it, they must be delusional and willing to believe in that which is not real. Authority is a claim and a false one at that. It is an illusion of a diseased psyche. It is a form of mental illness, the belief in authority. It is based entirely in violence. That's the only thing that backs up the claim of authority, is violence. And it is built upon the erroneous, dogmatic, religious belief. Authority is a false religion. Make no mistake about it. And the religious belief is that some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands, while other people are their slaves who have a moral obligation to obey their master's commands. These are called, of course, laws. The concept of authority is actually the most dangerous religion that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. And it has temples, rituals, symbols, just like any other cultural religion. This is a new, covert religion. People don't think of it as religion, yet that's exactly what authority and government are. They are diseased religious belief systems that must be purged from the mind as the mental, psychological, and spiritual viruses that they actually are. Next slide, please. My question, see, we could analyze this in a myriad of different forms, right? We can look at taxation, the confiscation by force, by duress, of the fruit of the labor of another. You know, and people have analyzed that. Well, what percentage of it is not slavery? If 100% confiscation of human labor is slavery, can we reduce it to 95 and it no longer be slavery? Can we reduce it to 50% and it's not slavery anymore magically? No, only zero would not be slavery anymore. Okay? We can analyze it from a perspective of, um, you know, prohibition against substances you can put in your body. Or if you don't have bodily autonomy to put into it what you wish, or to not have put into it what you don't want in it, then your body belongs to another. This should be simple common sense. Un unfortunately, most people don't see it that way. And those who don't are incorrect. We can look at licensure and a, a host of other things. But common sense really dictates that we only ask one true question. Has the very concept of authority ever been a moral concept? Has it ever been actually backed or based in morality? Okay, so next slide please. This is the old variant of authority, okay? You have a hierarchical and compartmentalized structure with a king at the top. Next slide please, or build. This was called in the ancient world kingship or royalty. It is authority vested in one being that considers themselves the sovereign, the ruler, the master. This was called the old world order because the old world order was ruled by this form of authority. It was overt. Everybody knew who the king was. Everybody knew that if you crossed the king's demands or laws or wishes, the henchmen of the king came after you and killed you or did brutal violence unto you. So this is the old world order. Eventually, people tired of living under kings and queens and experiencing their violence directly and overtly. Next build, please. So this is the new form of authority. It's the same structure, except at the top, instead of one being, there's an oligarchical few. So nothing has changed. 
The only thing that is different is that the quote unquote authority has been divested into a few beings instead of vested in one. Next build. This is called government, of course. This is authority vested in few or an oligarchy, a few rulers. This is the new world order. But you see, the new religion is exactly the same as the old religion. Nothing has changed except the name and it has been euphemized to appear as something different when in fact it is the same form of violence. This has never been moral. This has always been based in violence, coercion, and duress, and has always been an immoral structure to believe in, to participate in, to enact. Anybody that has taken part in that structure willfully is an immoral being. They are a bad person. It doesn't matter whether they're participating in overt slavery and control or covert slavery and control. You cannot be moral while believing in that system. It is an impossibility in nature, regardless of what one thinks in their own mind or how they justify those belief systems. Next slide, please. You can call that system whatever you want, but I call it what it really is, and I don't sugarcoat it. It's slavery. It's always been slavery. It's slavery now. It will always continue to be slavery regardless of what anyone thinks of it. If they don't recognize it as slavery, they are wrong. That is the eternal truth of the matter. Next slide. Today, we have some people that have made the recognition that this is our current condition. Again, that's why this part one is called the, the current human condition, the problem. So let's analyze the problem like this. Here's a person who realizes that the problem exists and they realize they gotta get from here to there. And the top of that peak on the mountain, next build please, is true human freedom. Or in other words, the abolition of slavery, of government. Next build please. This person represents someone who says they want freedom. And I make the delineation between somebody who's an actual freedom advocate and doing the things that are required to get to freedom versus someone who pays lip service to freedom, who says they want it but isn't actually doing the things to achieve it. In between the person who says they want slavery, representing the so-called freedom movement in our world today, and the actual peak, the goal, true human freedom, next build please. There are requirements for achieving the goal. And I am here to tell people the unfortunate reality, the truth of the matter, that the so-called freedom movement, the people who say they want human freedom, have not made any true, accurate advances through the requirements for attaining that goal toward the goal. At least in the last 16 years that I've been doing this work, and I've been well aware of what's going on in the world for longer than that, from an insider perspective, not from book knowledge. I work with some of the people who are the eugenicists of this world. I work with some of the people who are the real covert controllers of our world. At a low level, admittedly, not a very high level. But my background showed me a glimpse into the corridors of real power that sit enthroned behind ostensible power. And it was enough to scare the living shit out of me and wake me up and get me to start blowing the whistle on all of it. Because the depth of evil that I even saw is nowhere compared to where it goes and most people have zero clue. Not even a small bit. In all the time I've been doing this work, I feel like we've actually gone backwards. More people may be aware of the problem, slightly more, but so few people really understand the requirements for attaining the goal that it's pitifully sad. Pitifully. They have not correctly analyzed the problem. They have not correctly identified what the solution to the problem is. And they're scattered in a million ways to the four winds of the earth about how they think this problem should be solved but they don't really have the master key in hand. Next slide. This is a little bit of light humor that I bring in. This is the modern freedom movement, unfortunately. Yeah, it's dark humor, but you know, I throw a little bit of it in. You know, I call this guy Chumpy the Hamster because you know, the freedom movement is chumped, to put it in street lingo. 
Okay? They're going around like that ham proverbial hamster on a wheel, and there is no movement. It's lip service to movement. But they haven't made any actual measurable progress toward the goal. And I'm not here to pat people on the back and say everybody's doing such a great job. I'm here to tell you the hard truth about what's going to have to be done. Because I fully do understand the dynamics of what will lead to that mountain peak. And most people have zero clue what it involves. I want to get this guy off the wheel and get him moving to the goal and up the mountain peak. But well, we got a long, 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 long way to go to get there. Next slide, please. Part two, why does the problem of humans, human slavery persists? So the truth regarding human nature. So we, we have to delineate between a condition versus what actual nature is, right? Human nature is not that we are either good or evil. We can be worked into those conditions, and that happens through information that we take in, that we believe, that we use to make all of our decision-making processes, and then what we act upon in the world through our behaviors. The human condition has been worked into a state of slavery because of what actual human nature is, and it's not what most people think that it is. We'll be talking about that momentarily. Next slide, please. I'm going to start this section with a quote about perception management and social engineering. These are just fancy terms for mind control. The people who really run our society do not do it through direct physical violence. They do it through making people believe through repetition and media that they must continue to support their own system of slavery through their behaviors in the world. And you can call that anything you want to call it, but I'm going to call it what it really is, mind control. And I worked with the actual social engineers and mind controllers of our world, once again, admittedly, at a very low level. But I saw what they did and how they operate and how tight-knit they are and how of one will they are. They're together like this. And what they say they're going to do, they do it, and they do it effectively and efficiently because their intellect is unimaginably superior to just about most people on this planet, unfortunately. They are the most highly intellectual. That doesn't mean that they're invulnerable or perfect or invincible. But they know everything about how human motivations, the human psyche, the human psychology works, and they can manipulate it at their whim. This quote is from Buckminster Fuller. He said, the dark ages still reign over all humanity, and the depth and persistence of this domination are only now becoming clear. This dark ages prison has no steel bars, chains, or locks. Instead, it is locked by misorientation and built of misinformation, caught up in a plethora of conditioned reflexes and driven by the human ego, both warder and prison attempt meagerly to compete with God. All are intract intractably skeptical of what they do not understand. We are powerfully imprisoned in these dark ages simply by the terms in which we have been conditioned to think. The mind precedes all manifestation. This is the fir first occult law, the law of mentalism. The mind is all and everything flows from the mind. Most people do not understand this. The change must occur in the mind. If the change does not in, occur in the mind and in consciousness, physical manifestation of anything different is impossible, according to law. In the cosmos, not man's law, nature's law. That's where the change is not truly occurring. We believe that we can vote our way out of this, create some new currency, create some new system, reform an existing system, and I'm here to tell you it doesn't work that way. The change has to happen here. It has to flow to here, ultimately, where some would say it has to start with the heart, with care, 
and then the mind can then create the manifested change in the real world. Next slide, please. This is the part people are going to have a hard time with. Our world is ruled by the occult. It's not what you believe it to be. Part of it may be, but we have to understand what occultism is at its foundational aspects. It's hidden knowledge. It's hidden knowledge about how the human psyche works. It's hidden knowledge about how the real laws of nature work. The word occult is derived from the Latin occultus, meaning hidden. And that in turn, that adjective is in turn derived from the noun oculus, meaning eye, where the word ocular comes from. Occultism is the study of the hidden laws of nature, specifically those laws which are at work in the invisible, mental, and spiritual domain far more than those that are at work in the visible or physical world. Therefore, occultism involves the acceptance acceptance of a much wider worldview than that which is ordinarily taken by the everyday person. Occultists, then, may be defined as those who study all the laws of nature, both those that are readily seen with the eyes and those which are much more difficult to see with the physical eyes or measuring instruments alone. And this is what the rulers of our world count upon that our worldview will not be expanded to su such an extent, and they we will stay in a limited modality of awareness, such that we cannot see the laws that are operating in the non-physical realm, the realm of mentality and the realm of causation that underlie manifestation. They're counting that we'll remain ignorant of those laws. Next slide, please. And that brand of occultism, I refer to in my work as dark occultism, because the occult is just information. It is just knowledge of how things really work. So as Derek eloquently said in his presentation, a hammer is just a tool. You can build a house with it, or you can crush skulls with it. The occult is just information. It's a tool to an end. If you use it for the uplift of consciousness, it's a very positive tool. If you use it for manipulation, control, and ultimately enslavement, it's an extremely negative set of tools. The wielder of the information is the one that sets the precedent for whether it's going to be used for good or evil. Okay. So I talk about the people who are taking this knowledge, holding it very tight to their chest, and using it for deception, mind control, and ultimately con control of other people through it by controlling the ignorant and deceiving the ignorant and manipulating the ignorant, I call them in my work dark occultists. At its ideological core, dark occultism postulates that knowledge of the human psyche and knowledge of the laws of the universe should be hidden, should be occulted, and held only by a few human beings, the self-proclaimed masters of the world. It is much more accurate. I, this is one of the hardest things I've ever done, is try to explain to people what the occult really is, what Satanism really is, what Luciferianism really is. They don't want to accept it because of their religious backgrounds, modalities, ways of thinking that come out of organized religion and cultural religious belief systems. I've been in the occult directly. How many people have ever been in an occult order or secret society, personally? You're, I'm the only one in the room, okay? So I was a priest within the Church of Satan in my past. I was appointed by the high priest and founder of the Church of Satan in San Francisco, Anton LaVey, before he passed away in 1997. I'm not proud of that. You know, I was roped into a cult, essentially. But you know what that did? That gave me deep insider knowledge of how cults work. And boy, did I learn how they work. And one of the hardest things is explaining to people Satanism isn't the worship of the Christian devil. It's a mindset of pure ideological selfishness. It's a way of acting in the world. It's a worldview. It's a way of seeing yourself and your relationship to the world and other people. 
and it's extremely sick, twisted, and psychopathic. And this presentation isn't all about Satanism. I have whole presentations on that topic from a first-hand insider's perspective, from a clergy member's perspective, quite frankly. But what I'm trying to do is just give you the base idea that what occultists really are, if we really want to think about this in the true way that it should be seen, is dark occultists should be seen as ancient, advanced psychologists. These are the social engineers that are really running our world through mind control. We should see them as advanced psychologists who hold and wield the hidden information about how the human psyche works and how the laws of nature that have thus been uh, henceforward occ occulted from us, for, hidden from us. They hide that information and wield it in ways which create for them a power differential over the ignorant. Knowledge is not power by itself. Knowledge is a means to power. It has to be applied through action to become converted into kinetic power. And they do that by exploiting that knowledge differential over the ignorant, the masses of humanity. Next slide, please. And here's one of the main things that they know and the average person doesn't know. What is the reality of human nature? Again, this is why the problem persists. That's the section we're in. Part two, why does the problem of human slavery persist? And one of the hidden pieces of information that needs to be understood is what human nature actually is. One of the other most difficult pieces of information to teach because so many people have completely conditioned reflexive responses about what they already believe human nature to be. And our owners and masters know this information on this slide is absolutely true. The human condition is programmability. It is not good, it is not evil. It can become either good or evil depending on how the information is taken into the being, processed over time, forms into a belief system, and then informs our actions. And they know this. We are not computers, but human nature behaves similarly to a computer. And then those who know it can fully take advantage of that fact, and they can manipulate those who are ignorant of that fact. This is where it all starts. The foundation is what information we take in to ourselves. And then we base our decision-making processes upon that information, and we ultimately base our behavior upon it. So human beings are programmable. We are a programmable species. Who's doing the programming is the main question. Those social engineers I talked about are the ones doing the programming. Much like computers, if a human being has a bad hard drive format, these are the conditions during a child's formative years. Formative years. The word format is right in formative. Right? Just pronounced differently. So people think it's somehow different. No, that's the drive format that gets laid down on the drive. Right? If it has a bad, you know, you could call that the file system. Right? How much trauma is in people's childhood laying down a bad format? If it has a bad operating system, which is the thing that's operating all around us, our culture, cultural belief systems, ways that we interface and operate with each other based on existing belief systems, structures, religions, institutions, schooling, etc. If that's bad, our operating system, all around us, our culture. And if we have badly installed software programs, how does a computer behave if it's a bad bugs in the software? It doesn't put out what you want it to put out. It puts something out completely junk. Okay, so if we have bad software programs, these are erroneous, rigid, and dogmatic belief systems, like the belief in authority. The output, if all of those inputs are bad, the output on the screen, and the output is our behavior, and the screen is our shared experience, what we call life on planet Earth, is also going to be bad. 
and it will contribute, all of those things will contribute to deteriorating conditions on a mass scale. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being will largely depend upon its programming or the quality of the information that is put into it, which enables it to process and create efficiently and effectively. In programming language, they have a term called garbage in, garbage out. If garbage goes in, garbage comes out the other side. If quality goes in through effective programming, quality comes out the other side and you get the response on the screen, on the website, on the printer that you want to see. Human life works very similarly to this. And the problem is that is occult knowledge. I'm giving you knowledge the secret society members hold and they don't want this understood. You know, it may seem simple and it may not seem like deeply hidden occult information, but believe me, this is what they don't want people understanding. Next slide, please. And even more than that, here's the main thing that they don't want you to understand. This is the secret of every secret society that has ever existed in all of human history. This is it. This is the secret of secrets. You know, the whole thing with the secret, the law of attraction, that's not the secret. This is the real law of attraction. Okay? Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal, and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of behaviors of beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. Now that's a mouthful, but if you analyze each one of those things in turn, it means these are not made by human beings. It exists everywhere in the entire manifested universe. It can never be changed or altered or escaped from. That's what a law actually is. It's a condition that is in place and you cannot escape its consequence. When we act in the world, if our behavior is of such a particular quality, we get a particular result. If we change the quality of that behavior, we get a different result. The universe in this way acts as a mirror. For what we put out, we receive back. Some people have called this karma. It doesn't work like people think karma works like they teach it in the cartoon world where you steal money from somebody, you walk out the door and a safe falls on your head. <laughs> Karma is aggregate. It operates over an entire civilization over long swaths of time. So there is often a disconnect between cause and effect. A slide that I used to use to describe this is a person sitting with big dominoes and he pushes one and then it goes all the way around in a big circle behind him and then eventually one's going to slam him on this side. That's how karma really works over time where you create a cause but you cannot see the effect coming back around. This is how natural law operates. The understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing our own conscience, which is the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. Conscience is, conscience is not action. It's knowledge. It's not emotion. The word conscience literally is derived from Latin con, meaning together or with, and skio, skiere, where our word science comes from, meaning to know or to understand. So you put them together, common knowledge. Common sense, that's what conscience is. It's knowledge that we should all have and all share together. Unfortunately, we don't have common sense as a civilization, as a species. The understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing our own conscience into alignment with objective morality. Morality is objective. It is a set of standards that actually define inherently in nature the quantitative and qualitative the qualitative difference between right and wrong behavior and this is the problem most people don't have that knowledge they don't actually know the difference between right and wrong and i'm actually going to prove that with some data 
This means definitively knowing which behaviors are rights because they do not cause harm to other sentient beings and which behaviors are wrongdoings because they do initiate harm to other sentient beings. That's what is required to be free. Freedom is hinged upon objective morality and whether the beings in any given civilization know definitively the actual objective difference between right and wrong. And I am here today to tell you that the bulk, the lion's share of humanity, does not actually know the difference between right and wrong. And that's why we're enslaved. Next slide. Natural law is about knowing our rights, not thinking, not believing, not feeling. It's about actual knowledge of what behaviors are rights, what behaviors are wrongs. There is a correct definition for what a human right is. A right is an action that does not initiate harm to another sentient being. That is the correct definition of what a right is. A behavior that does not initiate harm to another sentient being. Notice I defined it in the negative. So in order to know what rights are, you have to know what rights are not. You have to know the actual behaviors that do initiate harm or violence against other sentient beings. You can only truly define a right in the negative. This is called apophatic inquiry. It's defining what something is by defining what it is not. You cannot define a right in the affirmative. It must be defined in the negative. It is not the behaviors that initiate harm. I did a social experiment just before the pandemic hit in late 2019 when I was doing research for my documentary film called Mark Passio and the Science of Natural Law. We did pretty extensive interviewing all around the city of Philadelphia. And we asked many people, could you please define for us a human right? And they gave us all kinds, a huge spectrum of answers. And the main thing people thought rights were, were food, shelter, clothing. They believe rights are resources instead of actions. This is the type of skewed mentality and skewed social engineering that is done to human beings, where we believe the right to access something means that that thing is the right, right? I may have the right to access food, right? But that doesn't mean food is the right. The action of accessing it is the right, as long as I don't initiate harm upon others by doing that, you see. And that's what we went and asked people. Could you actually give us the core definition, the actual definition of what a human right is? And we asked a few hundred people. Zero people gave the correct answer. Now, I ask people this. If someone cannot define what something is, how can you possibly be aware of it? Let alone, how could you possibly keep it? You can't even define it correctly. You don't think somebody's just going to come along, snatch that away? Give me that. You don't know what that is anyway. You can't even define it. And we think we're going to keep something that we can't even properly define. Good luck. Next slide. See, this is skewed in the mind because of traditional religious belief systems. And I'm not here to purely attack religion. I'll attack them all equally, right? I think each has a core of truth within it that gets distorted. It gets blotted out by dogmatic belief and ritual and control and you know, you know, wanting people to come in and give, give the religion resources and obey its dictates and decrees, just like government. Traditionally, in the Christian tradition, the Christian tradition defined the seven deadly sins. And here's what they are, next build. Religion would have us believe that these vices are sins, pride, gluttony, sloth, lust, anger, jealousy, greed. Now, just dwelling in these things is not a great idea. I'm not going to say just go and do these endlessly and expect not to be uh, debased, right? Because these can lead to 
immoral behaviors at some point, but in and of themselves, they are not behaviors that directly violate the rights of other beings. These are not violent behaviors against others. Again, if you dwell in these modalities of consciousness, could they lead to you doing things like that? Sure, at some point. But if I indulge in too much food, that is not violating the rights of another, even though it may be gluttonous. Right? Look at the qualitative difference in the real sins, the real natural law transgressions. Now, let's look at the actual qualitative difference. Next build. The transgressions against the creation, against creation's law are all forms of theft. And here's what they are: murder, assault, rape, theft, trespass, coercion and deception. Every one of these behaviors is a violation of natural rights of another being. Every one of these behaviors is a form of theft, stealing something that one does not have the right to take from another. Murder, the stealing of life, you don't have the right to take. Assault, the, the theft of personal well-being, bodily well-being and bodily autonomy that you don't have the right to take. Rape, the theft of sexual free will association that one does not have the right to, to rob from another. Theft, the stealing of physical property. Trespass, the stealing, stealing of safety in one's living domain. Coercion, the, the taking of someone else's free will choice and ability to make informed decisions. And deception, taking of someone's right to make in, informed decisions through the reception of information and truth. Every form of true wrongdoing is theft. Therefore, natural law boils down to one sentence. Don't steal. The current condition of human slavery is proof that the people of this planet have not learned correctly what their property is and what their property is not. We are stealing in every conceivable way and we don't understand what we truly own and what we truly do not own. All rights are property rights. All violations of rights are theft. Next slide, please. The natural law of freedom goes like this. Freedom and morality are directly proportional and can never be separated from each other. And again, true morality and freedom are directly proportional not religious belief systems of morality. The real transgressions against natural law that define what rights are not. And then everything else is reserved as a human right. Actions that do not initiate harm against other sentient beings. As aggregate morality increases, aggregate freedom increases. As aggregate morality declines, aggregate freedom declines. I apologize, this was written in black text and it didn't come out quite as bright as I wanted it to, but this is a mathematical formula that actually defines human freedom. I'm actually going to write a scientific paper on it and submit it to a peer-reviewed journal. I'm working on that. I'm going to actually include the equation and explain it, but this means the sum of freedom is directly proportional to the sum of moral behavior as that behavior goes from zero to infinity. Very simple summation equation in mathematics, okay, for the left brain among us. Right, or the scientifically inclined. This is a science. This is not a religion. This is not a belief system. This is a science of how we receive freedom or we receive enslavement. That's the master key to everything. This is what the occult world does not want known. This is the inner core of the secret of every secret society that has ever existed, and you've just been given it. And you could take that or leave it, you could believe that or not, but that is the actual fact of the matter. Next slide. Part three, I'm gonna wrap up in this section, the only solution to slavery. And people will say, no, there's a lot, there's a lot. I would say there's one primary solution to slavery. There are ancillary things that be, can be done in support of this solution, but they themselves, in and of themselves, are not the actual solution. They are supportive measures to the solution. 
The, this is the actual requirement for human freedom. Let's open this section up. Number one, we must stop putting the cart before the horse. What this means is that most people who say that they want freedom incorrectly believe that the solution to defeating slavery and creating freedom lies in creating something new. As again, I started the whole presentation, there's nothing new under the sun. The solution is not to create something new. The solution is to stop being complicit with evil, to stop doing things that are not moral for a reward, to stop being complicit with anything the control system tells us we must do. The solution lies in taking all of our power back, and that is done through one word, and this is known in the occult tradition of Freemasonry, which I have extensively studied, as the lost word. Maybe you've heard of the lost word, but most people on this planet do not know what it is. The lost word is a simple word. It's not some symbol, it's not a book, it's not some statue buried in Alexandria, Egypt, okay? The lost word is no. And most people will not say it to evil. And that is why the condition of slavery persists. People believe we need to create something new, such as new systems of organization, new currencies, new technology, etc., on and on and on. New food growing techniques. These things are wonderful. I'm not here to like to, you know, put them down and say, don't do any of that ever. But they're not the solution in and of themselves. These things will always be doomed to fail if we put them first. Because something else has to be put first. Namely, truth. Next slide. And sorry to burst people's bubbles, but while I support and believe in these things and think that they should be worked toward, they're not the solution long term. Because all of the immoral people who believe in and support government and their agents, their henchmen, their violent thugs, will just come in and eradicate this stuff. They will not allow it to exist as long as the belief in authority exists. You have to eradicate the belief in authority, which is the belief in slavery. You have to be an abolitionist and get other people to become abolitionists first because that is deeply understanding moral principles. And that's what has to be put first. Next slide. You have to put the first things first. And I mean literally. Principles, the word principle, is derived etymologically from the noun principia in Latin, which means first thing, chief among other things, the most important thing. Principles are first things. They must be learned and made common sense. That's what conscience is. They have to, you have to do that first. You can't make that some ancillary thing. Principles have to come first before anything else, before any other form of manifestation will ever be able to succeed. And we're not doing this. Very few people are involved in accomplishing putting principles first through moral education. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Next slide. We have to understand that anarchy is the only moral philosophical position to take. No political position is moral. There is no such thing as a moral political position. Only the absence of rulership is the moral position. And again, believe whatever you want, what I said is still true. That is a fact of the matter in nature. The word anarchy, is, see we've been told anarchy is chaos, because that's how social engineering works, that's how mind control works. You repeat something and repeat it, you can keep repeating the incorrect definition to the slave class. Keep telling them black is white, up is down, good is evil, day is night, light is dark, and eventually they'll believe it because they've heard it so many goddamn times. You know, that's how mind control works. Repetition is the greatest form of mind control in any media. The word anarchy really 
is etymolo etymologically derived from the Greek language in two root parts. An, A or an in Greek, and I studied classical Greek. I attended a Jesuit preparatory high school and studied classical Greek for years. And you know, I learned my Latin and Greek really well because I understood very early on upon being taught it in my high school years that almost all the words we speak on a daily basis, at least 70% of them are derived from Latin and Greek, from ancient Latin and ancient Greek. So it's, it, it behooves us to really study ancient languages like that from where our language is derived. So I, I bring up etymology, etymology a lot in my work. Anarchy is derived from the Greek prefix an, meaning without or the absence of, and the Greek noun archos, archon, which means master or ruler over another being. It does not mean master in the connotation that it's a very learned person who has really mastered their art. No, it means I own you, that form of master. That's what archon means in Greek. The master of a slave, okay? Anarchy does not mean without rules. There are always going to be rules because there's always going to be natural law. It's inherent to the universe. It's inherent to creation. Anarchy literally means without rulers and without masters. So if you did a word association game with people and you said, first word that comes to your mind, without rulers, without a master, people are going to say, that's a free person. A free being doesn't have rulers. A free being doesn't have masters. But you then say, give me the word association, anarchy. They'll say, Chaos, lawlessness, you know, imagine. That's the occult world. They can convince people that the very definition of a word is the exact opposite of its true meaning. No rulers and no masters equals true freedom. Next slide, please. You can call it whatever you want. If you don't, not comfortable with the word anarchist, if you're not comfortable with even the word voluntarist, and you don't want to explain that one, I go with the term abolitionist. I'm an abolitionist, and it's the only moral position that there is. There is no other moral position except the abolition of authority and government, because they are all built upon violence, coercion, and duress, and that is ultimately slavery. Next slide. The only solution is a spiritual solution. There will never be a political solution to this problem. There will never be a financial solution to this problem. There will never even be a technological solution to this problem. I'm an advocate for technology. I know how to use technology. This is what I used to do for a living. I was an IT guy. I was damn good at my job. I know my way around computers pretty damn well. But that's not going to be the solution. There's a technological component to the solution, which I'm going to touch on in a moment. There is no political, financial, or technological solution to human slavery. We must become truly enlightened regarding objective morality and natural law first. Put those principles first. Advocate for the only moral position, which is abolition of government. And then teach that to others publicly to make it common sense all around the world. Next slide, please. Enacting the solution I refer to as doing the one great work. This is the magnum opus of the occult or the great work. The great work is setting aside our selfish intentions for ourselves and doing the work of moral education for others once we have learned it, once we have learned true morality. Now, let me ask this question by a show of hands. How many people themselves, you as an individual, your primary work and goal, your primary effort in life is the moral education of the populace. A few people in the room, but guess what? That would amount to a, hand, a tiny handful. And guess what? If we did this in a wider uh, you know, selection of people, that, that percentage would even go down much further. We're in a very enlightened space here. We're in a very enlightened room here together compared to the general population. Make no mistake of that, OK? Think about how small that percentage is even amongst our ranks. That's not good enough. That's nowhere near good enough. I'm not put, 
trying to put people down by saying that. I'm being honest with you about where our work needs to be. We want to build parallel systems, great. Give 20% to that effort, right? You don't want to put all the eggs in one basket. Put 80% of the eggs in the basket of proper moral education, especially of the youth. Put 20% in ancillary things, parallel systems, et cetera. You know, no, there's no, nothing bad, inherently bad in those things. So I just want to reemphasize that. But if we don't make it at least an 80-20 split toward moral education and principles, we cannot win. It's impossibility according to law. The one great work of ending slavery can never be accomplished unless and until the knowledge of objective morality and natural law is learned first and then published and communicated in the modern technological age with the tools that we have at our disposal in the forms of all different forms of media widely and freely over the medium that we call the internet for all to learn. This is the human birthright, this knowledge. It is not for the few. It is for all. It is for every human being to learn and take that knowledge into oneself and then propagate it to other people. And that is what our one great work to do if we want to truly fulfill the requirements to become a free people. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention. You can advance to the final slide. Thank you so much.